Uh, so today we're going to be discussing large scale flash purification, uh, sample loading, method development, and scalability. In the outline for today's talk, we're going to begin with cons uh, considerations for large scale purifications and then proceed to talk about processes for method development based on those goals. We're then, then going to discuss issues to consider when scaling up and getting, then finally uh, discussing how you can get more out of your large scale separations with the comma flash torrent. And then finally, we're gonna go through an example of using the automatic sample loading on the torrent to increase uh, throughput. So first, what are our large scale purification objectives? And so the things really that we need to consider for scaling up that might be different uh, when we're compared to a small scale purification is, is this gonna be a one-time batch or is this gonna be a rep repetitive process that we're gonna be using on a uh, multi-day you know, process or a regular basis? Uh, so how has this compound been purified before at small scale? So it gives us some starting conditions maybe to evaluate for the large scale purification. Uh, how often is the process gonna be repeated? What size column am I scaling up to? So this is important. Am I limited to what's on hand or am I gonna be purchasing a, a larger column and having it uh, uh, delivered and then scaling to that size? So that's important to, uh, to determine how much sample you can load on a per run basis to determine how many injections maybe you're gonna perform on a column if you're doing like a reverse phase separation. The other kind of key component is the isolation of the compound or removal of compound from the sample matrix or goal. So are we interested in isolating a pure compound, or are we interested in removing the, uh, a compound from a mixture? So this can be uh, you know, a question for some different goals of your purification. How pure is the initial sample to be purified? This is gonna dictate the amount of compound you can really load onto the column because those impurities uh, you know, contribute to interaction with the silica and things like that and occupy those spaces so that your compound can't, uh, and that minimizes the loading. Uh, what's the necessary resolution for the method? Like I said, how pure, pure does your target compound need to be? And then how are we loading the sample? So this is really important to understand the solubility of the sample. Can we do liquid injections with this or do we have to do sam solid sample cartridge uh, loading uh, to be able to get our compound onto the column and into solution? And then there's kind of just important tips uh, for method development to kind of keep in mind. And, and ultimately what we're, interested in for method development is to optimize uh, our purification so that we understand the cost that go into it. Uh, time that we spend on method development now becomes more valuable the more runs that we need to, need to do in the future. So if this is a repetitive process over time, then we're going to spend more time with method development. If this is just a one-time run on a large scale, then maybe, uh, you know, how long the method is, it's, it's not going to be a big deal in the, in the, um, larger scheme of things um, or the amount of time you put into that saving 10 minutes uh, uh, on a method that you're going to only do once doesn't really uh, isn't really a significant labor cost but 10 minutes per run when you do, you're doing you know 200 runs over um, you know a period of time now we can start to see some savings by doing additional method development um, for the method some kind of tips here, you know, if it's a first time method, then TLC can be a really good starting point uh, to determine what uh, range your compounds are looting in in the gradient. Uh, the other thing is you can do a quick scouting run with a focus gradient to maximize the resolution and then increase your sample loading amount. You know, the thing to keep in mind is when you, we run a default method from zero to 100% in the normal phase or five to 100% in reverse phase, that really doesn't maximize the resolution or the loading capacity for your, your compound for the column. Uh, a lot of times the compound that we're interested in is really only, only actively being separated during about, you know, 15 to 20% segment of the gradient. So everything outside that range it's either kind of sitting at the top of the column, not moving, or we've already collected our fraction and the compounds off the column. We're not doing anything that's relevant to the compound. Um, it's easy to scale up to the large column from a quickly optimized smaller column run. So run, the, run that smaller column and optimize the method and scale up. And then if you're doing multiple you know, iterations of, of a purification over time, uh, multiple injections, it's, you, know, you can think about using isocratic methods 
Uh, this could eliminate the need for column equilibration. If you've got a really pure starting material with of, of two compounds that are closely eluding, uh, then you could use isocratic methods to separate those and do uh, minimize your column equilibration needs. And then also maybe even potentially solvent recycling outside the peak. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is when we're doing method development, now we're doing multiple runs over time. Uh, we really want consistency for our runs. It's important to consider maybe wash runs at the end or after so many runs so that we can kind of restore the column uh, and getting rid of any impurities that have kind of bound to the column under the method conditions you've been running that have been optimized. So the next portion of our talk is we're going to discuss transfer and scale up uh, of our method up to the large scale. And so ultimately, the process is kind of going to follow this, this sequence here. So you're going to have an, uh, an existing method on the small column or you've, opt, uh, you know, you've um, got some TLC da data that gives you a starting conditions on the small scale. Um, and you're going to run that method. You're going to see how your separation performs. And at that point, then we can go ahead and start optimizing that method uh, for on the small, small scale column. So we might be adjusting the gradient percent or the gradient length, the slope, so that we get good sufficient resolution. And once we have sufficient resolution, then we're gonna go ahead and uh, determine how much sample can we load onto that small column and still allow for baseline resolution. So this, this is nice because it factors in the amount of compound we're putting on the column, but also the volume of the uh, solvent that we're using to dissolve the sample. So that's important too, because it's also factoring that in. Next step would be once we've validated our method on the small column is we're gonna go ahead and scale that up to the large column. And so we'll follow a scaling procedure uh, to proportionately scale the small column to small column method to the large column. Uh, and then perform that first run and say, okay, this, this works. So we can go ahead and repeat. Uh, or maybe we can load more compound at the large scale um, for some reason, or maybe we need more resolution still. We need to tune down the loading amount too. But this allows us to verify that it's working before we commit to multiple injections uh, over time. So when we're scaling up from other columns, so maybe you guys have a, um, an alternate system. You're not quite, you're not using our uh, uh, stationary material yet, um, but you're transferring to a large scale ready set, ready set gold column. It's important that you validate and verify that method works on a smaller scale, smaller size uh, ready set or ready set gold column because of the differences in selectivity in the media. Um, it's important because you know we can get a good starting point from you know the silica of another manufacturer um, for a method to run on our column, but sometimes the selectivity is a little bit different, and you may be able to load more compound. Um, you may need to adjust the percentages a little bit based on that selectivity. So you need to kind of verify and see where that's at, and if it behaves similarly to the other media. So once we've verified that and corrected for any potential differences in the selectivity. Now we can go ahead and evaluate, you know, our loading capacity for it. Um, you know, things to keep in mind when we're switching media is, you know, how is the how is the compound, you know, is it being retained more or less? Might need to um, decrease the percent B to accommodate for that, or increase the percent B if it's not um, coming coming out soon enough. Maybe it's more um, has more retention um, with the new media, and then we can go ahead and optimize the method length and then maximize the sample loading. So. What solvent do we want to use for injection? How much can we load without influencing the chromatography? And then finally, what's the concentration of our sample in the dissolution solvent? Then we scale up, verify the method, and then we're going to try it on the large column. So when we're scaling up to the large column, we've got a method we like on the small column. The easiest way to scale up is to work in column volumes. And basically, what that means is that Column volume is the, the time it takes for, uh, if you had a compound that eluded at the solvent front to travel down the column. That's how much kind of void space is in the column once we've packed it. Um, so one CV, if a compound is traveling at the front, basically would elute that compound on a small column is equivalent to one CV on a large column. So if I have a smaller column, let's say it's got a hundred milliliter column volume size, and my larger column's got a 10 liter column volume size, it would take 100 milliliters to elute that compound fully off the small column, and it would take 10 liters of solvent to elute it fully off the big column. 
um, but we can directly proportionally scale from those factors. And so if you look at the uh, below on this slide, we've got a, a method uh, spreadsheet here that you can follow. And it's got, um, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but you guys could pause it at this point. Um, we, we, if you're looking at the recording and go back and see that we've got uh, several different time uh, components for the small column, columns A through G, and then H through K are parameters for the large column. And we can determine what segment times we need for the large column based upon uh, following these directions here, uh, one through 11. So the next important part for our method development is to maximize the loading amount. So this is really where we can gain, make easy gains to our throughput, uh, increasing our throughput by maximizing the sample loading. So, you know, the amount of compound we load per run, it means less runs overall, which is going to save you solvent and save you time and ultimately save you money uh, on a per run basis, right? So some of the parameters that go into this is, you know, what is my, what's my stationary phase? Because that dictates kind of the initial loading amounts you can do. And so in general, um, the mass of the sample uh, to the mass of the column, we can kind of uh, estimate how much we can load onto there. And so for functionalized media like C18 or C8, it, you can really only load about 0.1 to 2% onto the column. Uh, but for silica, you could go 0.1 to 10%. Uh, with our gold silica material, you can load up to 20% because it has uh, um, more surface area to interact with the compound. And so we can load up to 20% on that media. Now, I want to point out, this is just a starting point. Notice there's a range, right? And it's really dependent on your method. So your method and your compound and your sample. If you have a method that has sufficient baseline resolution, then you can go ahead, go ahead and load more material. Um, if you have a separation that has really close eluding peaks, then that's going to limit how much sample you can load onto it because you don't have the baseline resolution to, to give, um, to, to compromise with. So just keep that in mind. We have had some examples uh, on reverse phase media, C18, of customers doing up to 10% loading on their columns. Um, so keep that in mind, you can go even higher than the ranges. It's just dependent on your separation and your compounds, um, the compounds that are, you know, the impurities that are next to your compound, sorry. The general rule of thumb though, is that we can scale up proportionately from the size of the method development run to the large column. So for example, if I'm using a 100 gram ReadySep C18 gold column for method development and the conditions I've verified and validated and, and seen that, okay, I've got baseline resolution for my compound, I'm happy with that, um, that I'm gonna go ahead and, and I've loaded two grams of sample onto that, I could scale that up to 6.6 .6 grams of sample on a 330 gram column or 76 grams of sample on a 3.8 kilogram column or even on the larger scale at 8.6 kilogram column, I could load up to 189 grams of sample at 2% loading. Like I said, keep in mind, we have customers using the 8.6 kilogram column and they're loading uh, up to 10%. So they're loading 860, 860 grams onto the column per run and getting uh, sufficient results for their, for their purifications. And that increases their throughput. So here are some potential issues to consider when scaling up. And so one of them, one of the big things is, is the mitigation of the dissolution solvent effects, right? And so we talk about this in small scale chromatography. And, and one of the ways we like to get around the solvent effects is being able to do solid, using solid load cartridges uh, to load our sample because that basically eliminates the uh, injection solvent. And the compounds are gonna be on the, the solid cartridge until it reaches a percent B where it travels down. This is something that we really can't do if we're trying to automate a process and do consecutive runs. Um, we'd have to you know, change out the, the sample cartridge each run after we've loaded our sample. So that's something we can't do without user intervention at, the, at this point. Um, so to be able to do multiple runs in a row, we would need to be able to dissolve, dissolve our sample and be able to pull it up through the system and load it onto the column. And so, Dissolution solvent can have a major impact on the chromatography and the loading of your sample. And there's good, good cases of 
um, being able to load large dilute volumes in a weak solvent uh, in the peptide and oligonucleotide industry um, for those purifications, uh, as they're able to basically load their compound onto the column and the compound doesn't move at all under those loading conditions. So it just sits at the top of the column and they're able to do multi column volume injection volume. So uh, if they've got a, a CV of, you know, 200 milliliters, they're able to load like a liter of sample and the compound just not moving through the column at all. So this is an ideal case. This is something that's great for their application. It may be useful for some of yours, but it's, it's the ideal situation to load in a solvent that's weaker than our starting chromatography conditions. And that's what happens in, in this case. This is the exception and not the norm though. We know that we always have solubility issues with our compounds. We need to get them dissolved quickly. And we like to choose some of our more polar solvents to do that. Um, but those affect our chromatography. So you got to keep that in mind. The other thing that kind of maybe some tricks to help reduce the peak broadening from loading is one of the things you could dilute the dissolution solvent with a weaker A solvent before loading. So instead of loading like 100% methanol, maybe we're loading in 50 50, um, or maybe even getting it down a little bit lower and just loading a larger volume. The key is to have a mobile phase consistency, consistency that's less than what our starting percent is. The other thing we could do to kind of mitigate that if we're not able to get into the low percent B when loading, right? We could equilibrate at a slightly weaker solvent than the starting condition also. So say we were starting at 30% B for our, our separation, because that's where the, you know, the compound comes off around you know, 30%, uh, 35%. Maybe we equilibrate that at 20%. And what that does is it helps dilute the strength of the injection solvent and mitigate kind of the compound moving down the column during the loading process. And so we've had good results uh, with that for users too just going about 10% below your starting composition where the compound starts traveling. This is a really good visualization of the, you know, your choice of dissolution solvent and the effect on the loading. In the left example here, we have a colored compound. We've loaded it in a strong solvent. And you can see that it's traveled down the column here uh, during the loading process. So we haven't even begun the run yet. It's already traveled about all the way, some of the compound has traveled all the way down the comp column. And you'll notice some peak fronting there in the actual chromatogram because of that. Actually, you'll notice a small peak coming out with the solvent front also, in addition to the, the fronting. So the second example there uh, shows that after loading, you don't see any of the colored compound. It's all up near the cap there. It's all not visible. So that means that it's sitting at the top. It's not traveling down. And the uh, next picture shows the compound eluding in a tighter band in a, during the run. And you'll notice in the chromatogram, we don't have any peak fronting. It's a tighter band, and we don't have peaks uh, coming out with the solvent front either. So how can we apply this to the torrent and get more out of our large scale separations? So first, the comma flash torrent, uh, you know, it extends flash purification capabilities to meet our large scale purification needs. Uh, allowing us to increase our throughput with reliable chromatography and a user-friendly interface. So we can go up to a liter per minute flow rate. We can do binary gradients between an A and a B solvent. Um, you know, we can and go from zero to 100% with a, a variety of different solvents, normal phase and reverse phase. Uh, we can purify up to 860 grams per run, potentially, um, in, in some cases. And like I said, this is dependent on application and your column type. But higher flow rates allow you to use larger columns, and this increases your sample loading capacity and increases your throughput. The, the next great thing about the Torn is based upon our peak track software that you find in our next gen uh, in Combo Flash RF system. So easy to use interface, walk up and go to purifications. It's an easy transition from those systems. You could, you could imp, uh, export your method from there import it onto the torrent and then scale up and you're ready to go if you have a method on the, the, the other systems, you can easily transfer that over. The safety features. So this is really important at large scale. Now we're, we're working in, you know, multiple, you know, tens, hundreds of liters of solvent, right? So, you know, if there's an air in the system and you get solvent overflow or your uh, solvent runs dry or your waste overflow, these are bigger issues when we get to the larger scale there, you know, the volumes we, use, we are using is, is um, you know, something you need to be aware of. So solvent and active waste level sensing. So this is really important. 
Solvent's not going to run dry. You're not going to overflow your waste container. You've got vapor and pressure sensor alarms so that if there's a leak or a spill, it's going to stop the system uh, and present, prevent uh, further use um, and further uh, spillage. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, you know unique tubing used in the system because of the high flow rates. We have a static dissipative, dissipative, dissipative tubing that is used to prevent any um, spark by the high flow rates and the static buildup uh, in the system. So this is these are important considerations uh, when we're scaling up to these large um, large runs. It still has a compact design. You could fit the system on your on your lab bench. And then finally, there's lots of configuration or mo modules to configure to meet your needs. So you can customize detector options, fractionation op options, and even sample introduction techniques to meet your unique needs. And so one of those, um, you know, one of the versatility of the, the torrent is in the sample loading. So we can do a lot of different techniques. So we could do liquid injection via syringe, your traditional liquid loading. And that, that works great on the torrent, easy to use for like a one-time run. Uh, but when we're getting to these larger scales, we usually have to inject pretty large volumes. And at that point, it's easier to uh, have the system load that sample for you versus injecting it via syringe. Uh, another option is to use the solid load cartridges. So the injection valve on the torrent makes it very similar to the next gen, um, you know, our, our smaller flash system offerings, and it has an injection valve that enables true walk-away automation of your column equilibration, your sample loading process, the actual purification of the run, column and cartridge air purge in the normal phase, and then post-run valve cleaning. And then there's obviously multiple different sizes of solid load cartridges there that you can load pre-packed or empty, depending on what your needs are. Um, so this is a really great loading technique if you really only need to load, uh, you know, do one single purification. Um, solid load cartridges are a great way to go because they mitigate that solvent effect from the injection solvent. And then when you're on the torrent, the actual software, you're starting your run, you hit the play button and the run requirement screen shows up. And this is where you select what your sample loading technique is going to be. Am I going to do automatic loading, which we'll go into detail in the next section here. Uh, am I going to do a solid cartridge load? So I'll choose solid pause if I've already got my sample, if I need to prepare my sample still. Uh, so my column can equilibrate and then I'll bring my uh, solid load cartridge loaded on there and begin the run. Or I could do solid uh, right away. And that means I've got my sample already prepared. My solid load cartridge is on the system. It's going to do the equilibration and then it's going to begin the run immediately after that. Liquid injection is another option via the syringe. You can do that, do the equilibration come back, inject your sample. Uh, and then finally, you can also do directly onto the column uh, where you maybe you need to do a uh, continue a previous run or you already manually loaded your sample onto the column. And basically you're gonna skip the equilibration. And so the great thing about our torrent is that it is uh, you know, fully compatible and integrates with our ReadySep and ReadySep Gold columns. So we have RFID sensor inside the torrent, just like on the next gen, so that it identifies the column type, the column size, and pulls up the method parameters that would be uh, pertinent to the run you're getting ready to perform. Uh, the RFID tag sensors, uh, 80 gram up to three kilogram column, even the 8.6 kilogram column has a, a, a RFID tag for you that you can um, put in place there to begin your run. The larger columns, the 750 gram, the 1.5 kilo, the three kilogram column bodies, all of these have large inlets and outlets to minimize flow restriction to mitigate, uh, minimize the amount of back pressure from running at these flow rates. Um, on these columns so that we can, we can not have overpressure situations on these columns at the higher flow rate. It's easy to scale up methods from a smaller column uh, to another larger column or even from another R, uh, Combo Flash RF system. Like I said, you can import and export um, from those systems onto the torrent. And then we have a new 8.6 kilogram column that's in our ReadySep Gold C18 material. And that's on the right here. Uh, this is a larger column, so it doesn't mount onto the torrent like the uh, three kilogram column does. Uh, so it has tubing that comes out from the torrent to the column and then back to the torrent. And that comes with the column. 
And you know, the great thing about all of these columns is these can be used on any flash system. So not just on the combo flash or in the combo flash, you know, on the next gen or the RF plus, you can use these on any system. Um, and you're gonna be offered the advantages that we see with our ready set gold media, like the spherical particle size, uh, smaller particle size, so we can have maximum loading. Uh, like I mentioned before, going from ready set regular to ready set gold material, you could double the amount of compound that you're loading uh, just by changing the stationary phase material. You could make even make potential, potentially greater gains by switching to the ready set gold material from other manufacturers' medias. The other thing to kind of keep in mind with these systems is that, uh, you know, how are we collecting our fraction? This is an important for, uh, you know, the configuration of the system that you purchase and then, you know, the configuration for the runs that you're doing. So we have kind of two different major options uh, in addition to just manual collection by switching to different vessels yourself. Um, the Foxy R2 high flow fraction collector, uh, you can chain up to four of these Foxies uh, to a torrent system. And you can collect into uh, 16 to 25 millimeter test tubes uh, in the racks. You could collect into 450 milliliter bottles uh, in the racks as shown here. Uh, the other option is to use a funnel rack so you could collect unlimited quantities in any container uh, below the system. Uh, these all have RFID techno uh, identification technology. So we know what rack size is on there. So you're not overfilling a tube because, oh, I forgot to change what the volume of the tube is. Um, that's not, it's not an issue with these systems here. We can collect based on volume with triggers from de detected threshold, uh, slope changes in the detector, or even time windows. And this is great for your method development and validation to establish time windows on your scaled up column. So as we're scaling up and we want to automate this process, um, you know, we want to be able to validate that the fractions are pure. So this is a really good way to cut fractions and say, okay, yeah, this is the, these are the tubes that I want. Uh, I see where they come out in my time window and they're pure. Now I can set up my time windows around that and still have pure fractions to play with um, and not have to repurify after the fact. The other thing is if we're doing an automated process on the system, fractionation valve is a great way to go. So we can collect up to six different time windowed fractions and, uh, and a separate waste uh, for defined proto protocols that we're repeating. Um, and so basically, you know, if I, I, I'm doing, you know, 20 injections of this sample and I'm interested in, um, you know, the single compound here, I'm going to set up my time window. It comes out at about five minutes, but I've got good baseline resolution. Um, you know, sorry, let's, five minutes is probably a little bit early. Let's say 15 minutes. Um, and I've got, you know, good baseline resolution from like 11 to uh you know, or let's say 12 to 18 minutes. So I could set up a time window where that collects into fraction one and that all of that time window goes into fraction one. I could also tell it to collect in that time window and only collect once that UV peak is triggered also. Um, so the fractionation valve is really good for allowing you to go into a larger container than, the, uh, um, than what the fraction collector offers with the uh, funnel racks. And so the final portion of the talk here is I'm going to talk about some examples, uh, an example of the automatic sample loading on the torrent and its ability to help increase your throughput. So the automatic loading, uh, like I said before, when you begin your method, um, automatic is one of the, the options. And this is what it's referring to as the automatic liquid loading of your sample. Um, so basically, it gives, gives you a menu here. Um, and you're going to inject the amount of injection per run. So if I've got a liter of sample and I'm going to do 200 milliliter injections per run, I'm going to type in 200 milliliters here. Uh, next, I'm going to tell it to perform how many injections. I would tell it five in this case, and then it's going to tell me underneath how many liters of sample I have. And then finally, I can also adjust the injection flow rate. So if I have a viscous sample, uh, maybe I need to run at a lower flow rate than what my run is. Uh, in order to avoid overpressurizing the system in the column. Uh, and this helps prevent damage to the column if you're to overpressurize it. So this is important. Um, important for you to be able to control that. 
So this is what the torrent sol solvent selection valve looks like. And not only does it allow automatic loading, but it also adds an additional B solvent for you. So now we have, instead of one B solvent on the torrent, now we have a B1 and a B2. We can have any binary gradient that's formed between A and either B1 or B2, and we can change from B1 to B2 or vice versa in the middle of the run. So we could have a potentially um, have a wash step there at the end of the run with a stronger solvent so that our column is uh, being maintained. Additionally, it adds a third, third line that's our sample inlet line for loading liquid sample onto the column, and it's going to use the B pump to do this. And so this allows us to do sequential injection of the same sample without any user input. So I could set up 10 runs to go. Uh, I've got my you know, liter of solvent, two liters of solvent there. I'm doing 200 milliliter injections. Uh, and once I've got it set up, I could walk away. And it'll run all 10 runs without my input. To be able to use this feature, you do need to update your peak track software to 2.1.65 or newer. And it can only be used on torrents that have operating system two uh, installed on it, okay? If you have operating system one, you're not able to, uh, to, to use uh, this feature. Operating guidelines for this, we are going through the B pump. So there's some things that we need to uh, do in order to uh, make sure that we have an accurate volume loaded per run, and then also to protect our B pump. So one, the sample light needs to be manually primed to the solvent select valve uh, via manual control. And so the tubing that runs from the container of your sample to the solvent select valve is clear. And so we would go to the manual control and we'd select solvent B and choose sample. And then we would set a flow, flow rate of about 200 mils a minute. And then we would go ahead and prime the B side with the sample. And we would observe the sample up to the solvent select valve, and then we would stop it. Um, we just need to prime up to the solvent select valve. After we're done priming that, we're then going to auto prime the B and the A lines. Uh, so we would close manual control, go to tools, auto prime, and then auto prime the B line. And this removes any air that we've pulled in that was in the uh, sample line. And then it will follow that with the auto prime of the A automatically really good practice when you're done with your runs to flush the sample line with B solvent. So you would switch the B, the B sample line to a new container with clean solvent and flush through in manual control uh, so that we get rid of any particulate that was left in the line and clear out the line so the B pump doesn't have any issues later. The other things we need to consider with the torrent solvent selection valve, because we're going through the B pump, is we need to be aware of some general sample guidelines so that we don't cause damage to the B pump, okay? And like I said, for best chromatography, we've always, you know, we always want to choose a, as weak a solvent as possible for dissolution. Um, when we're loading sample through the B pump, we need to make sure that the sample is well filtered and free from particulates as uh, any particulates in the B pump will cause uh, um, a decrease in, in lifetime and replacement for the, the B pump heads. So that's something you need to be aware of when you're loading your sample. Uh, another kind of trick to be aware of, uh, it's good practice when we're loading our sample to maintain the uh, homogeneity of the sample. So you might want to stir or gently heat the sample to ensure that there's good diffusion and even concentration of the sample. That way, when you do your first injection, it has the same concentration as the last injection after 10 runs. Um, and so you might need to do that with more viscous samples and, and things that kind of start to layer out in your solution. So just something to be aware of and a suggestion for that. The other thing is that you can use the solvent selection valve on the torrent or the torrent AQ. Okay, the Torn AQ is a system that's dedicated to reverse phase use, um, but the, you can use this valve on either one of them. The only thing you need to be aware of is that if you're using it for normal phase separation, you can't go above 90% hexane uh, in order to prevent premature failure of the B pump uh, for your loading solution. Okay. Uh, if you're working in the normal phase and trying to optimize, um, you know, a method so that you could maybe reuse a column. Um, there's a couple of things you want to keep in mind regarding the silica. 
you're really only going to be able to do this if you're doing isocratic separations or gradient methods that don't start at 0% B. And the reason for this is that the silica uh, at the beginning of the run from you know 0% to 100%, uh, as we put the polar solvent on there, it ends up pushing some of the water molecules that are uh, that we have associated with the silica um, off the column. So the column is actually going to perform differently from run one versus two, three, four, and five. Uh, because of that. And so if you're doing an isocratic method, then you can kind of get away with that because you're not really changing the uh, composition of the silica at all after you've done that first run. Um, so it's just something to kind of be aware of. Uh, you know, if you're starting at a higher percent B, then you might be, you, you should be okay. That, that doesn't seem to be as, uh, as affected, but anything that elutes really early in the normal phase could be moving around quite a bit based upon that selectivity change in the silica because of the water being removed from it. The other thing to keep in mind when using the normal phase is, is that you can't really use it day over day, okay? And the reason for this is that the column bodies begin to swell uh, with this, the organic solvent over time. And so you can do multiple runs in a row during the day, but you're gonna get some column swelling and that's gonna affect your, your column integrity uh, column bed integrity uh, over time, and then results in possible column channeling and, and degradation of your purification. So you wouldn't want to be reusing normal phase columns over multiple days. And so finally, this is an example in, in, uh, of the 8.6 kilogram Redisep gold column being used. And this is, the, this is being used in the purification of CBD concentrate. And the goal is to remove unwanted THC, which is the last peak there. Uh, at about nine minutes, uh, or sorry, nine column volumes in the method, sorry. So this is a, an example of 10% sample loading on the column. So they're loading 860 grams of sample per run. The injection volume is 1.6 liters in, in, a, uh, in methanol. And this is an example of run, run one versus run 20 on the same column. And you can see that the performance is, is, uh, is practically the same. We don't see any, any shifts of the, um, any major shifts of the compounds. And that fraction between four and eight minutes there is the cut that they really want. Uh, you know, that's the CBD there. That's the other cannabinoids that are okay to be mixed in with the CBD. And that's their cut that they're getting. From uh, eight to 10 minutes, that's the THC cut. That's what they need to get rid of. Um, and you can see that that's not really, you know, after 20 runs, it's, it's working fine still, okay? And you can see the optimized step gradient that they have for that, uh, for that repeated, repeated process. And I think last time I checked in, I think there are over 200 runs on this column. So, um, so it, it has, uh, you know, really good performance. Keep in mind that the column reusability is dependent upon your application. So uh, in this case, you know, they're, they're removing a compound. They're not specifically targeting purification of the CBD. So there's a little bit of forgiving forgiveness uh, in this purification versus trying to isolate a compound with 95 purity. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind. Um, and their methods are optimized for their, their cases there too. Other application areas where you could use this larger scale column and automatic loading with the torrent or the torrent AQ. Uh, natural products, uh, other natural products, batch processes to isolate target compounds from the natural products. Um, you could use the 8.6 kilogram gold C18 column and the solvent selection valve could be very useful for automating that process for a large batch of, of, uh, of sample. Uh, and your pharmaceuticals, any scale up of your API and drug development, um, any customers that are currently using the 3.8 kilogram C18 columns, this would be, uh, you know, a, a wise um, thing to look into to see if this increases your throughput because now we're working in the higher uh, flow rate range of the torrent and you're maximizing the capabilities there. So we're also increasing this, the loading in the same amount of time. Uh, peptide, peptide and oligo purifications, uh, you know, not only purification, but large scale desalting processes, this could be uh, very useful for. Uh, the foods and flavors industry, uh, you can improve your repetitive batch processing uh, and increase your throughput again. Same with the petrochemical industry. And for your dyes and markers, uh, you know, increasing your throughput to the larger column there uh, and automating some of these processes is definitely an advantage 
um, that the Torrent or Torrent AQ can offer with a large scale column like the 8.6 kilogram Ready Step Gold C18. So the last thing I wanna do is I wanna highlight some of our upcoming chromatography series webinars. Uh, and so April 6th, we're gonna have a guest speaker uh, and this is gonna be a unique webinar for us. For us. Um, Dr. Dr. Christopher Coxon uh, from the Institute of Chemical Sciences um, School of Engineering and Physical Sciences at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, UK, um, is gonna be presenting about discovery and optimization of new anti-migraine peptides. And so he's going to talk about his research, but he's also going to talk about how uh, he was able to use our uh, next gen 300 plus and our ready set gold material to really uh, allow him to purify these peptides so that he could move forward in his research. So he's going to be discussing that and the use of our systems and medias to accomplish that. So that's going to be very interesting. Uh, and I encourage you guys to sign up for that. Uh, on April 21st, we're going to be back to our normal monthly webinar, and Jack Silver is going to be presenting uh, how to do easy prep gradients from your analytical runs. So getting focus gradients for your prep runs from analytical systems is going to be describing the process for that and how uh, the software and the AccuPrep makes that easy to do. And then in, on May 19th, Todd Anderson, one of our other uh, application specialists for the AccuPrep, uh, he will be discussing uh, methods and techniques to improve prep HPLC. So he'll be talking about some tips and tricks and, uh, you know, what the AccuPrep can offer you. And obviously, we'll continue to have monthly topics to follow. Uh, and lastly, the last thing I wanted to point out is that we have started a uh, blog uh, on our website to uh, engage users and and experts uh, and kind of create dialogue and conversation about different topics in preparative chromatography. Uh, the blog is called Sharper Peaks Ahead uh, and you can find it there at the uh, address listed there below. Uh, and with that, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them now using the QA function in Zoom. Uh, we'll get some of these answered. Okay, so we got a couple questions here. Uh, first one, just going back to uh, slide 13 when I was discussing different strong and weak solvents. Um, you're questioning what I meant by that. And uh, so weak solvents typically in the reverse phase, uh, you know, uh, for your reverse, reverse phase system. So something that's probably diluted with a little bit of water. Uh, so that would be your weak solvent in that case. So working that way with it. Uh, for normal phase separations, then yeah, it's going to be more strictly uh, kind of a polarity uh, um, thing. So less polar solvent typically is going to be weaker uh, in the normal phase. So, um, you know, so hexane is our base solvent in uh, the normal phase a lot, or DCM is your base solvent. So dissolving in those kinds of um, solvents is going to give the ideal separation conditions. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is just starting in a condition weaker than your percent B. So like I said, if you're starting at like a higher percent B for your, your run, working below that's a good starting point for your uh, mitigating dissolution effects. So, uh, Another question here is uh, why running 90% uh, hexanes on the B pump of the torrent um, is, is not good for it. Uh, so the problem is, is if you're running in 100% hexanes with the material in the B pump, uh, it has a lubricity issue and it causes the pump to seize. So uh, that's why there's a special pump head in the Torrent A pump, uh, different material that uh, enables us to use hexanes on that without issue. Um, but that's not on the B side and we're loading through the B pump. So we have to be aware of the that limitation there when using it on the Torrent. Um, so if you have further questions about that, feel free to feel free to let me know uh, and we can follow up on that in more detail. Uh, another question is what, you know, the differences between the torrent and the torrent AQ and, you know, specifically the, the main difference is, is in the, the physical differences is in the, the, the different pump heads. So now we have uh, pump heads that are the same material in both the A and the B pump because it's a dedicated reverse phase system. And that allows for longer uptime because uh, those pumps, pump material has a longer lifetime uh, than the A pump in the regular torrent. Uh, and so that's the that's the major uh, physical difference between the two. The torrent itself, you could use in normal or reverse phase, like I said before. Um, 
you know, so if you're going back and forth, the torrent is a good, a good uh, system for that. But if you're dedicating a system purely to reverse phase separation, uh, then the torrent AQ is going to give you a um, is going to be cheaper in the in the long run uh, with maintenance and and uh, having less downtime. Uh, let's see here. Another good question. Uh, doing a purification on a gold C eighteen column, uh, four hundred fifteen gram gold C eighteen column, and they're unable to get separation between the two peaks. Uh, so de depending on kind of your method. So if you're using like a default method from zero or from, I guess, probably about 10% to 100% if you're in the reverse phase here, a lot of that time of the gradient isn't really spent where you're getting good separation between those two close eluding peaks. So um, without seeing the run in front of me, I can't really tell you where, uh, you know, what percent, you know, to kind of focus around and, and maybe uh, optimize your gradient around. But um, if you spend more time in that range where it's actually separating down the column rather than just sitting at the top or it's already collected at the tail end of the, the run, then you're gonna get more, uh, better separation between those two closely eluding uh, isomers because it's gonna be more similar to isocratic conditions, which typically give us better separation um, between those two isomers. The other thing you can do is, is loading. So maybe you need to reduce your loading for that if you have two really close eluding compounds or maybe scale up to a larger column, but don't scale up the, the loading proportionately also. So that's another option. If you have co-eluding um, uh, compounds and you're trying to uh, maximize resolution between those two. So um, feel free to reach out to me, to my email though, if, with your specific example, we can take a look at it and see if there's some other ways maybe we can help with the, the separation. Um, my email there is joshua.lovell at teledyne.com. So feel free to reach out and we can um, see if we can help you uh, further. Um, let's see, I think I'm not seeing any other questions here. Oh, here we go, perfect. Uh, one more here. Uh, with the solvent select valve, the sample solution will always flow through the B pump. Um, so the system automatically primes the B pump after this. After this with the B solvent prior to starting the run flow to the column. Okay. So the question, I guess, is, is regarding kind of the how the system uh automates the process for loading your sample and then moving to the B pump. So you have to manually, well, you, you have to tell the system to prime the sample line, and then you will do an auto prime of the B solvent line and your A solvent line, just like you would for a uh, normal set of runs that you would be doing. Um, so that takes care of the priming. And then if you do your subsequent, subsequent runs, so your next run, you don't, you're not worried about, uh, you don't have to displace any air because the, the sample line hasn't lost prime and your B line has also not lost prime. Um, so you don't have to worry about doing that in between runs. So the, the system takes care of that for you. So you get an accurate injection volume um, each run. Okay. Next question here. Uh, I think the last one, unless another one pops up here. Uh, it says, do we need the filter when we use a weak solvent for dissolution? Uh, and if I use a weak solvent, solution, weak solvent, my solution does not look clear. I'm using a C18 gold column. So I, I guess I, I should emphasize that we still need to maintain, you know, sol solubility. So um, if we're adding the weak solvent and we start to see precipitation, uh, then, you know, we might not be able to decrease the solvent strength. And that's where you need to maybe use a method where you're equilibrating at a lower percent B um, instead to help dilute that as it hits the column. Um, but you should always be filtering your samples before if you're loading through the B pump because you want to make sure that you're not getting any particulate in there. Uh, the other things you can do potentially is you can gently heat that solution um, and, and some good stirring potentially to help dissolve, uh, keep it dissolved. Um, that's something that you could try to um, and that, that encourages kind of a consistent loading also when you're doing multiple runs. So, um, but the key, yeah, solubility is still important. You, you know, I talk about adding the weak solvent and, you know, sometimes we can't do that because the, this, the sample will not dissolve in it. And in those cases, that's 
that's going to be a limiting factor for our method because we're loading this the sample with a large um you know injection volume of, of strong solvent and that's going to affect your chromatography and it's just kind of how it how, how it's going to be uh because of the nature of your compound so um we, we kind of maximize the uh loading based on the amount of compound and then also the amount of injection volume and, and the solvent that we're loading it in. So uh, I don't see any other questions. So if uh, you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out uh, to me via email and uh, we'll, we'll get those answered for you guys. And I appreciate you guys taking the time today to talk to us um, and hope you guys have a good rest of the week. Thank you.